This is Chargers Unleashed Podcast. Here are your hosts, Dan Wolkenstein and Jake Hefner. Welcome to another edition of Chargers Unleashed. Jake Hefner and Dan Wolkenstein here with you from the LA Football Network. Today's show, of course, is being brought to you by Bet Online Charger Bolt Family. If this is your first time tuning in, make sure to hit that like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Dan Wolkenstein, week one of training camp officially in the books, was there for day four. The plethora, the masses, the Chargers fan base that was there for day four on the first Saturday of training camp this year. I got to tell you, I know that you and I were both there on day one and we really liked the, the, the turnout for that, but it it felt it just because it was in more of a smaller type setting. It felt bigger than fan fest, man. Like people were shoulder to shoulder. You know, we're talking eight rows of people deep. The, the, the bleachers are completely packed. I mean, the Chargers fan base showed out in droves on Saturday to support their team. Uh, The fans heard, I mean, the the players heard it. Everybody else that was on the field heard it. Uh, They came to represent. So first week of Chargers training camp in the books. Excited to talk about it. We got a lot to talk about it. I know as Dan and I have been alluding to this week, it seemed like the defense, you know, was getting their wins early on the first couple of days. The offense slowly but surely has started to pull that back, and we're in much more of a better balanced competition at practice. So, before we kick it off, first off, Dan Wolkenstein, how are you, sir? I am good. I am great. Uh, love to see that you were there at training camp on day four. So, that means we were there day one, day three, and day four, uh, able to ask questions to all of the folks there for all the different days that we were there uh, on the grass. Uh, welcome to Charge Unleashed, everybody. We are excited today. Today, we're going to be going all into Day four, training camp details. Jake Hefner was there, boots on the ground. Jake, you are going to be the one kind of stealing the show here, kind of giving us the overview of things that we're going to go through. But Ronaldo Hill, we had, who's the other two that came up? Mike Williams, Rashawn Rashawn Slater. Slater, Slater, Those were the three that spoke. Yes. So some interesting conversations with them. And you're looking for Derwin James news, surprise. There is none. Uh, so we're, we're still waiting. We're still in limbo as he continues his hold in at practice. So if you're coming here expecting anything on that, I'm sorry to disappoint you. So, Jake, you mentioned it off the top. Uh, Chargers fans showed up, which the whole it's funny. I mean, Pat McAfee's talking about this now. You got folks all over the U.S. talking about Chargers fans like actually representing. And it's it's refreshing. It's this new world order, so to speak. And it just feels different. And I feel like every year we've said that. But this year, it feels different. You were there. Lots of energy. We'll talk about the press conferences. We'll talk about, obviously, the, ca- the takeaways. But, Jay, have got to pay the bills. Plus, minus. I wonder how many times people thought the Chargers were going to be adding an undrafted free agent from the USFL. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of what they do, isn't it? I mean, at this at this point, if you're if you're if that's your bet, I'd keep doing it at this point. <laughs> but yeah, so if the uh, over if the over under was 0.5 on bet online, I wonder how many people would have won that. But Jake, pay the bills. Yeah, because you. I mean, if you would have laid some money on that, you would have gotten a pretty good return. So, <laughs> Bet Online is the fastest and easiest way to wager on all of your favorite sports contests and events with first to market odds and betting lines. Find reviews and new- news for every league, including Major League Baseball, NFL, NBA, NHL, UFC, esports, and even golf. Bet Online continues to be the top online resource for all of your sports information from live in game betting props and futures head on over to bet online today or use your mobile device to join and make your first uh, sports bet use the promo code believe 50 that's b l e a v 50 to receive your first 50% welcome bonus on the very first deposit bet online where the game starts so jake new tight end from the usfl sage Surratt, formerly with the detroit lions i believe as well uh big news no news little news what are your thoughts so as it was reported earlier today, Dan, the Chargers went out and they signed Sage Sherratt, former uh, Wake Forest tight end, spent a little bit of time uh, with the Detroit, Detroit Lions practice squad last season, uh, most recently ended up playing in the USFL with the Birmingham Stallions. So if you really want to go watch productive film from Sage Sherratt, go back to his last year at Wake Forest. 
good grip of receptions for just over a thousand yards. I believe it was 11 touchdowns that he ended up putting up in his final year at Wake Forest. So some good tape if you want to reference it there for a possible tight end for that we may be bringing in here just as far as a camp body after the first week of, uh, of training camp concluding. But we'll see what ends up coming of that. Um, other news and notes, Dan, like I said, the Derwin James, everything on the water just continues to be calm, but nobody should be really be worried about it. I know that a lot of us, especially before the pads come on and practice tomorrow, would like to see Derwin James's name on that dotted line. Um, look, if it doesn't happen, it's really nothing to worry about guys. I wouldn't be worried about it at this do time. See, do you see how big a smile he has? Like he's fine. He does. Look, if you wanted to make a big deal about this, if he wasn't there at practice, if he was actually performing a holdout, then by all means, go ahead and do that. You know, some people even outside of this situation still curse Tom Telesco, but (laughs) I mean, there's nothing really to worry about in this particular circumstance. The deal's going to get done. There's optimism on both sides. Uh, Time will tell. So, I think before the season starts, before the regular season starts, besides the fact, would you want Derwin James practicing in the preseason? No. Um, Or at least playing in the preseason games? No, obviously not. They wouldn't do that. So it's everything at this point right now is just him getting up to speed. He's going to be just fine. Ronaldo Hill had mentioned in his press conference that they understand how much of an integral piece that he is to this team. So again, for those that are worrying, and I hope there are very few of you, you don't have to worry about it. Zero <laughs> percent chance that Derwin James does not get resigned. Literally yes. zero percent. Pretty much. All right, Jake. So let's get to day four. Uh, press conferences galore. We had three, uh, two players, one coach, uh, and then we had obviously all your takeaways. Um, Five hundred foot view. Before we kind of get into it, what was kind of your overall impressions? What was kind of the biggest thing you saw as day four? This was probably the best day that the offense had out there on the field. And as we noticed, you know, the defense has really shown up a lot of pass breakups, interceptions, um, would be tackles for loss that would be happening in the backfield. There wasn't as much of that on Saturday. So you saw when they were getting out there and this was the best part because Tom Telesco had came out and he was talking with Chris Harry and he had basically announced to all the Chargers fans in attendance that today was going to be predominantly red zone drill. So it's like, okay, now we're going to get serious because the day before they had just done drills in third down. So now you're like, okay, let's get to the red zone drills. And I'll tell you what, coming out seven on seven and then even further on in 11 on 11s, the offense looked very sharp. And I'm talking all three quarterbacks got wins on each time that they were out there. So touchdowns, it, um, maybe not necessarily touchdowns, but it just seemed like that there was more of a overall rhythm in the offense. You had wide receivers getting open this time and beating their defenders. Uh, again, the defense still got theirs, but it just felt like it was a more competitive day. Probably, probably the best day out of the first four for the offense. No question. Got it. Okay. So, uh, let's go into the press conferences, Jake. So we had Ronaldo Hill, we have Rashawn Slater, and we had Mike Williams all talking. Uh, some interesting nuggets you heard. I know we talked about, uh, you saw Mike Williams kind of talking about, you know, Justin Herbert, I think is on Twitter all over saying like, you know, that guy's pretty good. Uh, kind of talking about not being able to be at, in the playoffs and the Super Bowl yet, but he's looking forward to that. Uh, so, you know, maybe it says a little premonition. Uh, what were your takeaways? You were there. What were your takeaways from the Mike Williams conversation? From Mike Williams conversation, um, First of all, I love the the question that someone asked. Uh, you know, how good um, can Justin Herbert Herbert be? Essentially, and it's, it was just like he kind of just was like looking around. He's like, uh, I mean, I don't know. He's pretty damn good right now. <laughs> so it was just like a classic. Just like you know, it, it, it wasn't it wasn't as good as the Khalil Mack mic drop move on. But that was like the best answer that you can get. It's like I think he's pretty damn good right now. There's not. I mean, he can, you know, going from good to great, there's not much that you really need to do in that circumstance. Um, but Mike Williams, as far as just his, his talk, especially when they, uh, when they were talking about the new faces in the defense, because I had asked them, you know, a lot of new faces in this defense, when you're thinking about the young guys, JT Woods, just here, Taylor, Deontay Leonard, De- uh, De- uh, Deion Leonard, and then you had the new face like JC Jackson. That was the one, obviously, that he really emphasized. But he's like, oh, yeah, man, it's been a challenge for all of us just going up against these new guys, getting used to them. And then he was talking more specifically about JC, just as far as the battle that they've been having a lot, as far as just, um, 
you know, going up against each other in practices. Now, he, he kind of isolated it a little bit because, you know, it's different between JC and the rest of the corners because we're primarily, when I'm on, when he's on me, it's all going to be everything to the outside. Um, with the rest of the guys like Jasir, you're going to see more of that work with him and I more on the inside of the field. So, but he says, like, JC's been a dog essentially since day one, and he's really been getting <laughs> after it, and they've been going blow for blow in practices this week. So, again, it's one of those things that you look at when the defense gets wins like this and when you have a guy like J.C. Jackson showing up on day one already making plays, you got to love it. You do. You do. One of the things that I liked from the press conference with Mike Williams was what he had mentioned about uh, Gerald Everett, the new tight end. Yes. Um, we all talked about how much we were excited to see him come in and hopefully help with tackles for a loss, hopefully help this team kind of get some of those tough yards. Uh, Mike Williams, quote, He's hard to tackle. This is on Gerald Everett. He's hard to tackle. Just watching him in the pass, he catches for two yards, and then he breaks a lot of tackles and takes it for 20. That's going to add a lot of explosiveness to our offense. Jake, it's not just you me seeing it. It's not just me seeing it. That's everybody else seeing it. But Mike Williams and his Chargers offense and the players see the potential of Gerald Everett. And I'm telling you, I've said it for weeks. He's the most athletic tight end that we've had in this team in a minute. And to see kind of him out there, it's a new kind of era of tight ends for this Chargers team. Loved hearing that from Mike Williams because honestly, he feels like another just offensive weapon for this team. And Dan, again, it's 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 more than just the athletic st- standpoint. It's the it's the full capability of what this guy can do. Because you know, you talk about athletic tight ends. Okay, well, what's the last one you think of? You immediately think of Antonio Gates, no question. But Antonio Gates was never a blocking tight end. You never would use Antonio Gates on an end around, you know, type of sweep. That that was not what he did. Gerald's different. Yes, he's got the athleticism, but. He can catch, he can block, he can get yards after reception. And yes, as of the Chargers are already using it now, they're already using him on end around plays. So those thoughts that we had when he, they were first signed, you go back and you watch some of those highlights from him uh, in the Seattle offense, they're already bringing some of those aspects over to the playbook. And when you see it this early, that's a great sign for what you think that he's actually going to bring to this offense. 100%. So moving on. So we had then Rashawn Slade up at the podium. And he talked about all kinds of things. One of the parts that I heard him that kind of perked my ears was him kind of Googling over the idea of Khalil Mack with pads on starting next week. (laughs) The quote that he had was great. Basically, it was, I'm going to try to get this off. So his quote was, we're barely even rushing right now in no pads. And he's already put a couple of variations on some moves that I've never even seen before. I'm like, wow, I've never seen anyone do that before. He's very smart, very savvy. He's very powerful, too. And I haven't really seen that part of him yet just because of the nature of how it's been. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Big challenge, though. So Khalil Mack's the real deal. If you got Rashawn Slater talking about how impressive he is and how much he's seen from him already, like that's why we got him. Two top 10 edge rushes with him and Joey Bosa. Uh, Khalil Mack already making his presence felt on our best offensive lineman. I mean, it's it's obviously it's good to hear in, in that standpoint, but it also kind of confirms, Dan, what we've heard from Joey when talking about they just are different types of pass rushers. Khalil does things that Joey doesn't normally do. So up until this point in Rashawn Slater's career, the best that he's seen in practice is Joey Bosa. And then here comes Khalil Mack with a brand new bag of toys and is already throwing him against it. As you mentioned, the, the pads aren't even on yet. But for him to already be having this impact and as we saw on day one and every day since (laughs) this is the type of iron that you want to see happen whether it's your defensive backs going up against your wide receivers or in this case your edge rushers going up against your offensive line this is only going to make this team better when we get into the nitty-gritty of the regular season yeah and it's it's interesting and obviously you know I, I kind of do a compare contrast of Joey Bosa and Khalil Mack and obviously Joey Bosa has both power and finesse But if I were to kind of isolate each of those and kind of give their own categories, I see Joey Bosa more as the technician, more as the uh, finesse type. I see Khalil Mack as like brute force disruption type. And so I think Rashawn Slater being able to see both of those sides and seeing the best of both of those worlds has to be good news, not only for him to kind of have that practice, but also for the whole entire offensive line to be able to see the best of what can come to them this season. So that was my takeaway from the Rashawn Slater stuff. Any other things you heard from him in your conference? 
Yeah, I liked the the quotes that he touched on with uh, with Zion Johnson and with Trey Pipkins, because obviously Popper had brought up that, you know, there's still training together with Duke Mannyweather in the offseason and then what would have been the early impressions from Rashawn on on Zion thus far. And, uh, you know, his quote was really great as far as just the early expect or the early impressions of him. You know, quote, I can tell he's he's got a really good head on his shoulders. He's just smooth, confident. He's always looking at his playbook, watching film. He gives me he give, he just gives me calm energy. I can tell he's ready to go. I'm excited to watch him play. So it's good news. I mean, as as you said, Dan, your perception of it, nobody's worried about Zion Johnson. I haven't seen a single beat where it looks like that he isn't getting things right. Again, time will tell when the pads come on. I'm sure it's going to change dramatically. But early signs on you know, this, th- this guy's learning from some of the best and it's, it's good to see. So, um, next up, Ronaldo Hill was out there. And the part that I was interested to hear about is you and I kind of talked about on the last show. When are we going to hear somebody mention Jerry Tillery? So I guess my question to you, one, did he mention Jerry Tillery? And two, what was your biggest takeaway from, from that press conference? I mean, did he mention Jerry Tillery? Yes. Oh, but, but, <laughs> it was kind of it was kind of more in a backwards type of way because I can't remember who it was that asked the question if it was uh, if it was Jeff Miller if it was Daniel Popper but they were basically talking about the competition that's on the interior defensive line and what that has done bringing in guys like SJD bringing in guys like Austin Johnson Morgan Fox um, and basically he was just talking about it in a nutshell as far as just the competition goes as and you know some of these guys are going to get pushed some of these guys that are looking to battle roster spots now he didn't go off. In the circumstance, by calling out Tillery by name in that circumstance, but his name was never brought up actually by name. And so when he's talking about the guys who are, you know, these three defensive linemen that have come in and are basically talking, you know, uh, are being a wake up call to the rest of the guys at this position group, it it, it just kind of makes you think. It's interesting, Jake. All of the new guys seem to have kind of an inside track to starting and to playing meaningful snaps often. All of the incumbents seem to be on the outside looking in. And Tillery is in that incumbent position. And I'm not really even seeing him get much snaps, even in practice. The only thing that I saw him do was that he almost accidentally hit Justin Herbert in practice. I think that was on day two. (laughs) And other than that, that's all I've heard. And that's all I've seen. That would have literally been the straw that broke the camel's back if that would have happened. I feel like he probably would have been cut like minutes afterwards. Um, Ronaldo Hill did talk about, I think Stanley talked about this too previously. Jake, there are 40 new players on this team. And so like the amount of time it takes to kind of get all these guys up to speed and to gel and to get everything kind of uh, installed, like it takes time. And so when you hear Brandon Staley on Mike Up talk about how excited he was and how crisp day one of training camp was, and how fast they were to get plays off, and how they wish they had more plays. And the overall effe- efficiency within that, like that's hard to do when, you, when half your squad is new. And so you got to commend them for that. Ronaldo Hill, you mentioned, talked about kind of the, the competition with the interior defensive line. And it's got to be weird for him. I feel like it's a guy at Christmas, or at whatever holiday you have, where you have so many new toys you can play with. And you know maybe the previous... Christmas was not very good. You know, the best gift you got was maybe some coal. This year, you're getting like Xboxes and all kinds of stuff. So I think Ronaldo Hill is a happy camper now. Um, any other takeaways before we get into kind of the specifics? Yeah, to kind of elaborate on that, Dan, is basically he was just putting it in terms of urgency and talking about every rep, you know, counting. And guys that may consider themselves at the top end of the roster because you don't have player X behind you, it's not that. You know, it's not as simple as like, okay, you know, I'm, I'm penciled in as the starter. I can eventually correct what it is that I need to correct out here, but it's not, you don't necessarily have that much leeway here. Now you're talking about guys that are behind you that are hungry, that are trying to make this roster. And so you may not have as much rope as you think that you do in in this circumstance to ultimately make the, the, the final 53. Dan, the other quote that, 
is that he was definitely asked about Nasser Adderley's development. Mm. And uh, I really like the way that he put this because uh, we, we saw it a lot last year. He was playing a lot faster, more physical. We saw that was definitely documented in the games throughout the season. Uh, but I like how, how Hill said this quote, Nas, uh, he had a bit, you know, when he first got here, Nas had a big engine and he could run and he could cover so much ground. It's like a dog that gets around and he's just going fast. But now he has a calming to him. He understands when to use the gas and when not to. He's becoming more of a quarterback back there, especially not having Derwin there. He's the main signal caller back there. So it's allowing him to express himself in the scheme. And I'm really liking what I see. Oh. That is music to my ears. We've talked about the potential and how he has just been a hair off and he feels like he is running with his hair on fire and he's not quite able to kind of keep it under control all the time. And he's just kind of living off of instincts and sometimes it gets out ahead of him. If we can see that, and I think this is one of the benefits of seeing Derwin James not practicing is you get to see more reps from those other guys. If Nazir Adderley can become what... We've talked about multiple times. Daniel Jeremiah talked about the two best, the best safety pairing in the NFL, possibly. Oh, when he said that, I was like, Jake, that's what it is. That's what I'm looking for. So that sounded great to me. (laughs) (laughs) So, Jake, otherwise, you were there on the field during practice, during some of the red zone operations, 7 on 7, 11 on 11. Uh, What were your takeaways there at camp? from individual drills, from the players, things that people might not have seen either at camp that they were in the stands or maybe that they were listening to at the press conference. Well, I'll start off with the individual drills because obviously they broke they broke out on those after the, the first walkthrough of practice. I w- definitely went over to the defensive side immediately. So I'm standing in between. I got the edge group to, sorry, to my right. I got the linebacker group to my left. Um, Khalil Mack was already... Uh, in the ear of Carlo Kemp, one of the Chargers' newest acquisitions, basically just showing them like the, the proper rip move, what the coach is asking for. So you're watching them go, go through those drills, the footwork, the footwork drills on coming around off the edge. Um, and then, Dan, I know you like this, but Damon Lloyd was doing backpedal drills, and they were doing it underneath the tent, which forces you to stay low. Man, he's quick. Man, he is quick. <laughs> I told you. I mean, and he's already impressed numerous days in camp thus far. Um, This is four in a row. I'm really excited. Well, I mean, as as far as just overall play goes, when we got back down to 11 on 11, you know, I I didn't see anything stand out from him. But just in terms of athleticism traits, when you're watching these guys one-on-one, I know that he had made a bunch of plays for the first three days. I'm really excited for this kid to get the pads on, especially when we get to the first game of the of preseason. And, and we're, again, we're talking about a guy whose season was cut short very, very early, did not get a chance to play for this team last year. Um, and especially now with what you have going on at the linebacker position, you may need some insurance like this. So I'm really excited for him uh, going through those drills. Um, but again, the individual drills did not last as long as I thought they were going to be because they got right to the first group of seven on sevens. Um, so when Herbert was out there, I literally just went through like each individual play as far as the results go. So uh, first play for Justin Herbert, seven on sevens. He was out of bounds to the left. Second one, he caught Gerald Everett in the flat. The third, uh, Josh Palmer beat Asante Samuel Jr. in a slot and on the outside. It was a great catch. And then the fourth, no surprise, Keenan Allen touchdown over the middle. <laughs> I mean, Keenan Allen made a, a couple of great plays during this practice. Um, and then... I think that th- I think that that was it for yeah for that was it for Herbert's seven on sevens and then uh, Easton Stick was taking second team reps so him much like Storm Norton and Trey Pickens are alternating day by day it's the same thing for Easton Stick and Chase Daniel so Easton Stick got up there Mike Davis had a nice pass defended uh, defended over uh, Jalen Guyton then you had Eric Campmoyer uh, with short catch in the flat um, and DeAndre Carter Dan here you go DeAndre Carter. Nice catch in the corner of the end zone. And on back-to-back plays, he went right back to DeAndre Carter. Two. I like I like seeing him it being used in the offense. That's what I yep. was hoping to see. I know a lot of people were wondering if that was going to happen. I was clamoring that he's going to have that Joe Reed-type feel uh, and actually being used as a Joe Reed we thought was going to be used. Uh, DeAndre Carter, I think Mike Williams talked about how like he's like twitchy fast. Yep. And uh, you see it there with Easton Stick. 
Yeah. So then moving on to Daniel seven, uh, Chase Daniel seven on seven. So Spiller got Spiller got accidentally nailed. Um, I, <laughs> I couldn't tell exactly who it may have been. I right from my perception, I saw Jamal Davis standing there. I saw Cole Christensen standing there, but it was it was by accident. One hundred percent, the helmet even came off. Dan, <laughs> but he got right back up to his feet. Got right back up to his feet, ran back. But it was like, ooh, dude, <laughs> like come on, we don't have the pads on oh. yet. Don't do that. Uh, Dan, another wide receiver that you and I have both watched in practice, Michael Bandy. Michael Bandy is quick, he's shifty, and he had a great catch over Tavon Campbell in this particular seven on seven really? grouping. Yep. So he I really like West, he has that Wes Welker feel to me. A little bit. You watch him through the individual drills, man. I made the notes on him on day one, and he's got a lot of quickness going through the, and, and good footwork coming out of those drills. And then the last uh play for Chase Daniels in that seven on seven grouping, Joe Reed caught a nice pass in the slot. Joe Reed sighting. Joe Reed sighting. How about that? So <laughs> again, as you mentioned, this whole aspect with with DeAndre Carter, you know, being more than just a returner type guy. It's it's not going to make things easy for guys like Joe Reed and Michael Banny that are trying to make the roster at six because it's definitely not 100% that the Chargers would end up keeping six. I would like it to see it happen, especially when you have guys like this that are, are trying really hard to make the roster. But uh, obviously, time is going to tell on that. Yeah. So I guess two questions for you. I wasn't there. You were there. You have the eyes uh, and ears. Uh, so young guys in secondary, young guys in interdefensive line. What did you see from those guys? at those two positions. So Jasir Taylor, I mean, and again, we're now we're talking further into the 11 on 11s practice. Jasir Taylor made a great uh, leaping pa- uh, pass breakup right along the sidelines. I can't remember who the ball was going to, but literally he dove for it and knocked it down right on the sidelines. It was great. Came in hall, came away with, uh, with an interception. Uh, so that was nice to see. Um, who else was it? If I'm just checking Checking my notes here. Anything? I know Dean Leonard's had a big camp. I know Mark. Webb Dean Leonard had a big camp. camp. Uh, he didn't make as much noise as he had done through the first three days. Um, Ty Shelby blew up a run in the backfield. Just kind of going by my notes here. Again, we're talking about secondary, but some of the younger guys. Um, but yeah, other than other than the the Keeman Hall interception okay. and the Jasir Taylor play. You know, those are some of the, the the key standouts. Again, this was much more of a balanced practice where the offense was definitely kind of, let's just say for the majority, getting the better of it and trying to get some of those wins back from earlier on this week. Um, but after the seven on sevens, Dan, they broke out into individual special teams drill. And I really like the way that Ryan Fitkin is, is doing this because, Dan, it was almost individual drills. It wasn't just everybody lining up for a turn. So you had one group. They're doing one on one, right? They're doing one-on-one, but they basically had spaced it out where you have one group that is specifically focused if they were on the outside and they were going for the punt block. So they had the ball down there and they had them rushing around the hoop and going for the ball. Then you had the guys that were just beyond them that if they were simulating, if they were in the middle of the special teams going right after the snap and coming up the middle and what that drill was looking like. So it's just... But again, it's just it's a it's a great thing to see when we saw so much emphasized about special teams during practice last year. And so you're able to get more of the offense and defense going against each other in these practices. So um, it's just efficient special teams work. And I'm just really excited to see the improvement that's hopefully going to come with this unit. Last question. Was there anything that you saw from the interior defensive line that stood out? I know we got Austin Johnson, Sebastian Joseph Day, Tillery, the whole group in there, Covington. I mean, there's a bunch of guys there that's fighting for anything. Did you see anything yeah. that stood out? I mean, Sebastian Joseph Day had a would-be tackle for loss on Austin Eckler. Same with Brendan Fajoko. Would It would have been a sack, actually, if we were talking about real-time play. Um I want to say SJD almost had another one before Herbert got it off to Everett in that particular play. And then that that may have been it. At some point, I can't remember who it was that, that knocked him down, but uh, Ryan Hunter, the guard, ended up on his back after one play. So I don't know who it was that knocked him down. <laughs> not I mean, good not, when an offensive line gets a pancake. Not good. I mean, obviously, just from a standpoint of injury, but then, like, who the hell was that that put you on your ass? <laughs> you don't want to see that. Uh, but no, other than that... Um, you know, interior defensive line, those are probably the, the biggest standouts when it came to the rush. Okay, cool. So um, I guess the only person to ask you, 
the special team. So I noticed it. It sounds like you noticed it too. Like the amount of time spent on special teams is far less than we saw last year. Why do you think that is? Is that because they feel it's better? Is that because there's a new kind of regime and kind of how it's being structured? Like, what's the reason for that? Well, I think the it it could be it could be a combination of two things. One is coaching. If anybody who's looked at the history of Ryan Ficken and what he did for the, a very long time in Minnesota, you know that he's had special teams under his belt for a very long time. Dan, I remember when the signing happened, Minnesota fans on Twitter were pissed, but also congratulatory of the Chargers basically saying, you got a good one over there. And it seems like it's already paying off those type of dividends. But I think secondly, you know, you may take this as some of the ways that Brandon Staley is learning from his first year at training camp and what they were really focused on. And yes, was it an emphasis for them to focus on last year? Sure. Should it have been emphasized that much that we were seeing? Maybe not. So, I mean, again, I think it's a combination of both. I think it's confidence in your players that you know that you have brought onto this team that are going to be key in special teams play. And then however Ryan Ficken is, is running it, I think that Brandon Staley has basically given him the keys at that point in time. It's like, hey, when it's time for special teams drills, I'll just step over here and I'll just watch. Yeah, I, I do. Th- you're, you're totally right. I, I do think there is something to be said about confidence in the depth of this roster to where you're not having to coach up guys so much more than we saw last year. Whereas these guys, like you have ones who are known for special teams prowess. And last year, like you're just got getting guys all over the place. So um, I think it's roster. I think it's coaching. And I also think it's you're, to your point. I think it's also Brandon Staley realizing like you go ahead. We don't have to put the entire team watching this. We can kind of get things kind of separated. Yes. Um, Dan, other notes of certain plays. And I apologize that there uh, there was a pass breakup from Mark Webb that we got. So again, it's or I'm sorry. Not it wasn't a. Uh, a pass breakup. It was a t- it was a would be tackle for loss on the ah, play. Okay. Um, so again, here's another day of Mark Webb showing out, and we've heard Brandon Staley's yes, and we've heard Brandon Staley's comments on him thus far. Um, going back to Michael Bandy had a jump catch over the middle, and this was from Chase Daniels final eleven on eleven drills in the end zone. Um, so he made a couple nice catches. Uh, outside of that, uh, I'm not sure if you saw it. Great diving catch at the very end of of regulation for Isaiah uh, Isaiah Spiller. Great diving catch by him. Um, Sweet. Yeah. So th- there were some pretty impressive plays that were, were, were happening. So like I said, each one of the quarterbacks, Herbert, Stick, and Daniel, they both got the wins um, You know, on each one of their 11-on-11 11 11 rounds that they had out there. But uh, it was just a good balance pack, uh, practice. And you saw the intensity kind of rising up a little bit, and you saw that on day three starting. And I think with the pads coming on tomorrow, you kind of have to do that. So you have to get yourself in the mindset and get ready for it. But overall, Dan, it was a great practice. Um, you know, again, felt like it was much more of a balanced competition. And I'm just excited to see people get hit somebody. <laughs> yeah, I was. Okay, so on that note, so next time we see practice, we're going to see pads. Uh, what should folks look for differently with pads than what we've seen so far this week? It's going to be hard not to immediately watch when Khalil Mack is lined up across from Rashawn Slater and let's say and say, "Okay, kid, let's see what let's see what happens here. Are you going to be able to stoneball me the same way that you did Joey Bosa just a year ago?" So we'll see what happens with that. Um, obviously, you got to look at Zion Johnson. One of the biggest things that you really can't evaluate is your offense and your interior defensive line when we're talking about guys with no pads. Um, So those are obviously the key focuses on or the key positions to focus on. And then let's see what they do, especially when we're talking about running plays going on here, Dan. You've witnessed it. I've witnessed it, whether it's been Eckler, Roundtree, Kelly. There have been plays that have been blown up in the backfield. So what's that going to look like when we're not just talking about guys that are just touching and you're still seeing the running back just kind of, you know, twiddle through the rest of the traffic. Let's see the wide receivers when they're talking about blocking each other right off the snap. How much more physical is this JC Jackson, Mike Williams rivalry going to be when they're lined up outside each other? It's going to be exciting. Linebackers, I will say, are going to have their work cut out for them because you're going to see linebackers go up and actually have a tackle, be aggressive at the line of scrimmage, going up against those line, going up against the running backs as well as the offensive linemen. So uh, something to watch there too. 
Dan, I'm glad you brought up the linebacker aspect because I know a lot of people have been asking about this as, as was reported that Donald Parham was not practicing. Drew, Drew Tranquil was not practicing either on Saturday. Now, I believe it was when Rashawn Slater was at the podium. I'm on the right of the podium, and I do see Drew Tranquil right behind him walking with everybody back to the facility. Street clothes, no, no crutches, no braces, no nothing on the feet. He was wearing sneakers. Um, didn't look like there was any, any upper body injuries. So again, nothing official from the Chargers yet, but I didn't see anything that was on him. Didn't, didn't see a limp, didn't see anything like that that would okay. believe me to think anything or speculate otherwise of being specific. We'll probably hear more on that depending on if he practices tomorrow or not. But early indications were that it didn't seem like there was anything that could possibly be hampering him, but obviously we'll, we'll wait for more information on that. Got it. So day four in the books, week one in the books next week, all pads. Uh, Jake, I think, uh, I think that's going to do it. Is there anything else that we missed that we want to tell the good people before we head out of here for the rest of our Sunday and enjoy the week that comes with pads. We're looking forward to padded practices on now, man. This is this is where we're really going to get, especially if we're talking about the competition being this hot for some of the guys on the back end of the roster, some of the young rookies that are coming to make a name for themselves. Let's see what happens when the pads come on. Dan, let's not forget the giveaways that we do have coming up here over the next uh, three weeks or so. Remind me of the date, because I know that we announced on the last show as far as the Mike Williams signed mini helmet. What is the date dropping for that that everybody needs to have their entries in by? August 16th, I believe, is the date to have that in. Um, again, Mike Williams signed mini helmet for uh, a giveaway they're doing. We just finished up with the Derwin James one. We're going to do Mike Williams next. I think we're going to announce it on socials tomorrow, Monday, for to start the practice uh, in, in pads. But again, you're going to be just retweeting, following, and subscribing on YouTube. And you'll be signed up for a chance to win a Mike Williams signed mini helmet. In the meantime, you can go to... LA Football Network, go to the shop there, use the code UNLEASH, get 25% off all of your swag, whether it's the Joey Bosa, I'm not effing tired, whether it's Ford and Staley, whether you got your uh, rally towels here, which I don't know if you have seen these, but they're sick. So uh, get your swag at LAFB Network shop. Uh, again, use the code UNLEASHED, save 25%. Last but not least, we talked about it on the last show, Jake, text UNLEASHED to 31032. You can join the show Text us with questions. Text us with your takes, your comments, uh, thoughts, and we will be happily able to talk about them on the show. Again, text us, or you can give us a call at the hotline, 323-374-5651. Jake, I've talked too much. Let's go. You've talked too much. (laughs) I feel like I've been the only one talking. (laughs) Well, you're the one that has the goods today, so I'm going to let you take the reins. Uh, For Jake Hefner, you can find him at Jake D. Hefner, myself, at Dan W. Sports. Guys, thank you so much. And let's get excited for week two practice with pads. Football is back. Talk to you guys soon.